This is the Charlottesville Podcasting Network. Lectures, radio shows, and more available on demand at civilpodcast.com. I am Deepak Singh. In 1993, author Greg Mortensen stumbled into a village while he was trying to climb the world's second highest mountain in the Karakoram Mountain Range in Pakistan. He was welcomed by the villagers and he promised to build a school for their children. Mortensen visited Charlottesville on March 27, 2008 to talk about his book, Three Cups of Tea, part of the 14th Annual Festival of the Book. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, and I, I'm, not, I'm going to be very brief, I hope. I, I'm sure most of you, all of you, are familiar with the story of Greg Mortensen as chronicled in Three Cups of Tea. Um, it's full of great, poignant scenes, but there's a scene at the, near the beginning of the book that uh, I really love, and it's where um, Mr. Mortensen has returned to California after vowing to build a school for the people of Corfe, the people who nursed him back to health after his failed attempt to reach the summit of K2. And in California, um, feeling the dreams of dislocation, he retreats to a place that he considers his anchor, Berkeley self-storage stall 114. <laughs> and in this very familiar space, he wrestles with questions that ultimately change his life. And I'm just going to read a paragraph from the book. Hanging his harness, his ropes, his crampons, carabiners, hex bolts, and Jumar cinders neatly on the hooks, where they'd rested only briefly between trips for the last five years. These tools that had carried him across continents and up peaks, once thought unassailable by humans, seemed powerless. What tools did it take to raise money? How could he convince Americans to care about a circle of children sitting in the cold on the other side of the world, scratching at their lessons in the dirt with sticks? Well, through a lot of hard work, perseverance, and some incredible good fortune, Mr. Mortensen did and does, I think, manage to make us and countless others care about these children as he rhetorically asked in the acknowledgments of the book, what motivates me to do this? The answer is simple. When I look into the eyes of the children in Pakistan and Afghanistan, I see the eyes of my own children full of wonder and hope that we each do our part to leave them a legacy of peace instead of the perpetual cycle of violence, war, terrorism, racism, exploitation, and bigotry that we have yet to conquer. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Greg Mortensen. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and peace be with you. And thank you so much. Um, before we start, I'm just going to play a little three minute DVD, um, and I think it's three minutes, and, and then we'll get started. If you go searching the corners of the world for one place where America is winning its war on terror, you should know about this place and these girls. But the story of what happened in the little school with the new bullet holes in the walls actually began 11 years ago on a mountain. I felt defeated after K2. I was emaciated, weak, exhausted. Greg Mortensen had just failed to climb the world's second highest mountain when he stumbled into a remote village in northern Pakistan and saw children with no school. When I saw those 84 children sitting in the dirt during their school lessons, writing with sticks in the sand, I literally had this eureka moment. Virtually penniless, Mortensen took two years to raise money for a school. But when he returned, the villagers surprised him, saying, before you build the school, could you build a bridge? I've learned that it's more important to listen than to talk. The villagers carried supplies 18 miles. More importantly, even the man in the front of that line, the Muslim mullah, had come to trust the soft-spoken American. They built the bridge, and after nearly three years of hard work, built the school, too. Seeing his dedication and the personal sacrifices that he made in order to build that school just proves kind of where his heart was and, and how genuine and passionate he was about what, what he was doing. As Mortensen began raising money and building schools in Pakistan and then Afghanistan, teaching the basics without radical doctrine, his good reputation grew. 
but with dangerous consequence. Once, he was kidnapped by the Taliban. Twice, angry mullahs issued supreme religious edicts, banishing him. But, turns out the local commandant, seen here, had a daughter in the school. With local support, his forces imprisoned the Taliban, and all the school kids were back in class in two days. If you fight terrorism, it's based in fear, but if you promote peace, it's based in hope. What they see in, in um, schools is hope. At last count, 400 villages in the violent hills of Pakistan and Afghanistan are now asking for schools built by one American who speaks softly and carries no stick at all. There's a saying, when your heart speaks, take good notes. I followed my heart and I'm sure glad I did. John Larson, NBC News, Los Angeles. Well, I'd like to thank the Virginia Festival of Books and, and Robert. Where, where are you, Robert? So at the end, I have to find you so you can come up here and finish up. Thank you, Robert. He's the, uh, he's the president and the, of the Foundation of the Humanities, and Nancy, the program director of the Virginia Festival of Book. I don't know if Nancy's here somewhere. Thank you very much. And Susan Coleman and Cindy, and um, to the university here, I got to talk to some of the architecture school students, and also I'll be talking at some high school and elementary schools and and so it, it's such a great honor to be here and there's there's many people here who who are both unable to uh, get a seat when i first started talking after three cups of tea came out i was using my dad's you know 40 year old slide projector with duct tape on it <laughs> and my first two talks i had to do in uh, new york in manhattan and of course the publisher was horrified so they said you have to start using the powerpoint stuff so we're still Two years later, trying, trying to figure all the PowerPoint stuff out. <laughs> um, I had the great privilege to grow up in Tanzania, in East Africa. My, when I was three months old, my parents um, were from Minnesota, and um, they were good Midwesterners. Um, they were in a Lutheran church, you know, one. Sunday morning in early 1958. I was three months old and, and they heard that they needed teachers in a school, girls school in Tanz Tanganyika. So off we went to Tanzania where I grew up for 15 years. And it was a paradise. It was post-colonial. It was a d new democracy. Uh, President Julius Nyerere had something called Uhuru Now Moja, which means freedom and oneness or togetherness. And I got to go to school with children from two dozen different countries. I got to go to school with Muslims and Jews and Christians and Hindus and Sikhs and people of all faiths. And to me, that was a paradise. My father ended up founding a hospital called the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. And he had to raise $6 million in the 60s to get the hospital built. The first nine years, he raised $1 million. And the 10th year, he raised another $5 million. When it came time to open the hospital in 1972, my father gave up, got up and gave a little talk, and he said that in 10 years, all the department heads of the hospital would come from Tanzania. And there was kind of a chuckle that went out, and all the Westerners afterwards scoffed at my father and said, how could you dare say such a thing and set the people up for such an unrealistic expectation? So we came back to the States, my father passed away from cancer in the mid-80s. He, he was in the mid-40s, it was in 1980. And we got the annual report from KCMC, the hospital, 10 years later, and all the department heads were from Tanzania. There's supposed to be a picture of the book up on the screen right now, but I'll just pretend there's a picture cover of the book, okay? Three cups of tea. <laughs> Three cups of tea. First cup, you're a stranger. Second cup, a guest.